Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. We've got a little bit of everything in today's show along with of course the mystery box competition. So let's get started. First this week, a Kickstarter for a Raspberry Pi mod kit for the Sega Game Gear. Now I have fond memories of the Sega Game Gear, I had friends of mine growing up that had them and at the time they seemed like the coolest things in the world. Now history hasn't smiled on the Game Gear the same way it has the Game Boy, but I still think they're fantastic old bits of kit and this is a nice way of breathing new life into them. This is interestingly as well one of the first projects I've seen that makes use of the Raspberry Pi 3A+, which is of course a slightly smaller form factor Raspberry Pi. As you can see here, it fits into the back of the Game Gear and because of its smaller size, there's more space for everything else. And um, as you can see there as well, there is a custom PCB that has been designed to fit inside the Game Gear case as well. And the PCB is actually made of three different parts. There's the main part you can see here, which is where the LCD screen attaches to along with a few other peripherals. And then an audio board and a power board. And these three parts are all designed to slot nicely into the housing of the original Game Gear. Now, I've featured a few retro handheld gaming console things on this show, but this one has a particularly special place in my heart just because, firstly, the Game Gear is full of nostalgia and memories for me, but also anything that reuses old hardware and gives it a new lease of life is something I'm very, very much for. Um, far too much stuff uh, just goes out of date and is never really used again, and it's maker culture and it's people doing Kickstarters like this that are uh, bringing the old things back and giving them a new lease of life. It's something I used to do myself with old radios, in fact. There's a, a, a period of time in my life when I thought, I might actually try and make my money by uh, taking old radios and putting Raspberry Pis or Raspberry Pi Zeros in them and turning them into uh, internet enabled radios. This is that for handheld consoles and it is fantastic. And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, anyone who sees uh, Sonic the Hedgehog playing on a Game Gear screen who is a certain age remembers that exciting feeling of actually seeing this happen and at the time it seemed so impossibly cool and like the future was here. And of course now the future is here and we can put our future into that future. Things got very philosophical very quickly there, didn't they? Anyway, I will link to this Kickstarter in the description and as you can see there are a number of ways you can pledge. Uh, currently you can pledge £99 or more to get the two button mod kit and there is a version for the four button mod kit as well. Um, the difference between those two I will allow you to read for yourself rather than go through the whole thing. Um, but yes, this is, uh, this is the kind of project that I absolutely love. Uh, but I will warn, um, they are saying this is going to be a run of only one so if you are interested in this, I would get on it quite quick. Up next on Crowd Supply, the Smart LED Shield for Teensy 4. Now, um, there's a lot of ways you can attach LEDs to Teensy boards, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, of course. However, um, the particular panels that they're using are quite interesting. Um, uh, Hub 75 panels are something that I used to use in the past when I worked as a stagehand. I used to help put them up and take them down, albeit quite industrial heavy units. But the technology is exactly the same. Um, and they are actually surprisingly cheap. As the crowd supply mentions, you can get these things on AliExpress for fairly cheap, and as you can see here, this is $16. And just for context, that LED uh, display that you can see there is around about 32 centimeters by 16 centimeters. And if you're American, that's about a foot by uh, about half a foot and a bit. I'm sorry, I really try, but I don't, I don't, I just can't, things, feats. But yes, uh, these are very, very cheap displays and they're definitely worth playing around with. Um, I have a couple of these on order um, and this seems to happen to me quite a lot. I ordered these before I saw this crowd supply. It's almost like someone's listening in to all of my calls and putting things in front of me. Anyway, conspiracy theories aside, this does look like a very easy way to use these Hub 75 displays and they're certainly worth playing around with because they have enough pixel density to actually do some pretty good animations with. As you can see, various size of Teensy boards fit. And did I say Pixie boards before? I'm getting mixed up with those Pixie lights from a few episodes ago. Teensy boards, uh, various uh, forms of Teensy 4 boards will fit. And you can see there's quite a decent LED density to them. Now, one of the great things about this is that it makes uh, actually talking to these boards a lot easier. Um, I've never actually had hands-on experience of trying to work with them, but I do know it's very, very different. Um, I've installed them, but I've never actually had to control them, and the hardware that the professional used to control them is obviously very, very expensive. The great thing about this is they've made it work with Fast LED. If you are not familiar with Fast LED, it is more or less my go-to uh, LED library now whenever I'm doing anything with Arduino. It makes it incredibly easy to use addressable LEDs um, and their uh, documentation is absolutely on point and I haven't really run across anything I want to do with addressable LEDs that I haven't been able to do with Fast LED. And for me at least, it certainly beats trying to program them directly because that's a level of complexity that while I'm interested in, I usually don't really have the time to engage with. Anyway, as you can see, this thing's quite small and designed to fit on the back of hub LED panels. And it's also pretty cheap at only $25 for one of them or $40 for two. 
They are still on their funding journey and are about halfway there and of course I will be getting a hold of one of these because this is the kind of thing I would usually get anyway because it's cool but as I just mentioned it just so happens that I actually have pretty much exactly this board maybe from a different seller on the way to me as we speak so uh, yeah this is a this is a fantastic project if you are interested in LED screens in any way shape or form and have a Teensy 4 I would definitely check this out. Up next the Raspad 3 a tablet device designed to work with the Raspberry Pi 4. Now I know what some of you might be thinking, we've been here before, we covered a Raspberry Pi tablet a few episodes ago on Kickstarter, although that one was a little bit different. That one was designed for the Raspberry Pi Zero, whereas this is designed for a fully fledged Raspberry Pi 4. Now this is a completely custom case, as you can see from their promotional material, um, and it's not all that thick. I quite like the wedge display actually, uh, the wedge that they've got going on, because obviously it has to be a bit fatter than a normal tablet. Um, to fit everything in, but it does fit together quite nicely and I do like the look of it. Um, and of course, the fact that there's a Raspberry Pi 4 in there makes it quite powerful. Now I know what a few of you are thinking because it's almost become a meme on this show and yes, ETA Prime has covered this and yes, I'm not gonna cover everything because you should definitely go and watch ETA Prime's video on it. It covers everything that you do need to know about the Raspad. He actually has one of them and has a hands-on uh, experience with it and will take you through putting it together and um, the pros and cons of it. Um, so you should definitely go and watch that video, uh, but the couple of things that I will mention, having watched it and having read through all the promotional material, one of the things I really like is that it's no soldering assembly, you can just cl uh, click it all together, you don't need to get your soldering iron out, it's designed to be very simple to put together. One con that I think might stop me personally from investing in this particular tablet is the battery life. Um, in the promotional material they promise between three and four hours of battery, um, which I don't think is necessarily bad for a bright screen and for a powerful thing like the Raspberry Pi 4. But if I was going to have a tablet, I would want something that was maybe not quite as powerful but would last longer. Um, and realistically, I use my Chromebook for actually quite a lot of writing, despite having a powerful desktop. And that thing folds flat as a tablet, does have a Linux subsystem, and the battery on it lasts all day. So for me personally, it isn't necessarily uh, my use case, but this might be something that uh, appeals to you. So uh, check out the website, check out the ETA Prime video, and see what you think. And now let's have a quick look at a couple of projects from this week. Watermelon Boy, that sounds kind of cool. I wonder if it's going to be like a Raspberry Pi handheld or like, you know, even banana or orange Pi handheld or a... Oh! Oh! Well, that's a very literal interpretation. Yes, this is a real project by Sedi Shappi, uh, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I apologize if not. And this is actually putting a retro game machine inside a watermelon. Um, the video uh, of the build process is absolutely fantastic, by the way. Uh, very, very well put together, uh, very, very well edited. But the project itself is absolutely bonkers, and I love it. So amazingly, this video is actually a how to make a retro games console out of a watermelon. Um, if you are interested in learning how to make a retro games console out of anything, this video will still be useful to you, but I'd like to remind you that this is a watermelon. Nevertheless, the Reddit post was not a hoax at all. You can see here he is playing Pokemon Emerald on a watermelon. It is actually working. Um, and yes, uh, this is an absolutely wild project. I urge you to check out the video. It's very well put together. And this guy is, uh, yeah, a pretty charismatic maker and absolutely crazy. I love it. Now, this next project is a 3D printed yoke for flight simulators. And I think this is a very cool idea because there's no way I would ever buy a yoke controller for flight simulators. I'm just not interested enough in them. Most flight simulators just don't have enough destroying of the Death Star for me. So something like this would be perfect for me. A way of trying out um, having a proper controller for a flight simulator and seeing if it would be something that would appeal to me because this is completely DIY, 3D printed and uses an Arduino Micro. And here it is in action on the YouTube channel of its creator, which is Vince Prince. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it really does appear to work exactly like a yoke controller would. I mean, if you see there, he's subtly pushing it in and out, which is, of course, how um, they work, I, I think. Um, and yeah, it, it seems to be working quite beautifully along with what I assume is the latest Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, as I've said, I'm not really that into flight simulators, but the build, I really am. So yeah, as you can see here, the 3D print has gearing in order to capture all of the axis of uh, rotation needed to give a proper and accurate um, flight simulator uh, uh, controller and presumably also give it the right feel. Although again, I'm not 100% sure as to how important that is. Presumably very, very important if it's anything like racing wheels, which I do know a little more about. 
But again, the fact this uses an Arduino Micro is great. It means you can uh, set it up like you would any other uh, controller, and it uses the joystick.h header for Arduino, which is a very powerful library for getting your own joysticks working with the 80 mega 32U4 chips. If you are interested in trying to make this for yourself, Vince Prince has put it up on his Thingiverse account. Um, and as you can see, it's all of the parts you will need to get this thing going. And the code used has also been posted on the Arduino Create site. So flight simulators aren't necessarily 100% up my street, but they might be up yours. And this project is definitely worth a look if they are. However, I would definitely have a look at this project even if you're not into flight sims as such. Um, because what is here, the core of this, the soul of this project, could be applied to any other kind of game controller. And if you ever wanted to make your own controller, whether it's something that looks quite retro um, or something just completely crazy and off the wall, if you are, again, more like me and prefer flying around in space and destroying things, um, you could make a completely custom spaceship controller using exactly the same methods here. I will link the Reddit thread in the description of this video, which has links to the Thingiverse uh, page along with all of the code and a video demo on the Vince Prince YouTube site. Mystery box competition. Yes, it is time for the mystery box competition. In case you are not familiar with this concept, we have a mystery box that is completely mysterious. Look, there's even a bag on top of it to stop me looking inside it. Inside the mystery box are things that you can win. You enter the competition just by leaving any comment on a video and the following week we win, we draw a prize, sorry, and the winner is chosen from that comment section. So let's pick a prize. Okay, that's weird. That doesn't feel like, oh no, it's just a very small box. Well, good things can come in small packages. What do we have today? It's from Seed Studios and MediaTek Labs, Linkit Smart 7688 Duo. Oh, it's a, it's a little uh, development board. It's a little microcontroller type board. Let's have a little look-see, shall we? Ooh. Well, I, again, um, this is one that I am not particularly familiar with, so let me look it up real quick. Okay, this thing is really nice. Uh, I spent actually a little bit longer than I meant to uh, looking this guy up. Um, the Linkit Smart, it is a microcontroller in that it has an 80 mega uh, microcontroller on it. Um, it has the same, eight, uh, the same uh, microcontroller, sorry, as the Arduino Micro and the Arduino Mega, but it also has a chip on it, a processing unit, which runs a version of Linux. Um, and that's why you can probably see the little micro SD card slot there. Uh, this, yeah, this is really cool. This is not dissimilar to the Arduino Yun, and in fact it will run Arduino Yun sketches. What I don't know is whether it is a pin-for-pin -pin, uh, uh, copy of it. Um, but um, yeah, this is, this, is really, this is really cool. It hurts to give this one away a little bit, I'm not going to lie. So we have a prize, but now we need a prize winner. And the winner of the mystery box competition this week is Andrew N. This will be making its way out to you. We'll get in touch for your address. And for everyone that has been watching this show and leaving comments on the videos, thank you so much. Um, we'll be doing this every week until this box is empty. And then who knows what happens then? Anyway, let's get on with the show. And to round off this week's show, I want to show you a couple of YouTube videos that I found quite cool this week. Now, Sid E's Classroom is a channel that I have been subscribed to for a very long time. Um, I got into it some years ago when I was first looking into how to run Google Assistant on a Raspberry Pi. Essentially, build your own Google Home, but instead of the box that you get from Google, just using a webcam and a separate camera and a Raspberry Pi, and then using the Google SDK on the Raspberry Pi. Now, I tried to do it by myself, but at the time, I was in no way capable of reading the Google documentation and rolling my own. That's where Sid E came in. Now I'm still of the opinion that Gassist Pi or Geassist Pi is the best way to get Google Assistant working on your Raspberry Pi. He's been working on this project for years and it just gets better and better. Now I will link this GitHub in the description of the video, but what I actually want to talk about today is his most recent video, which is how to set a factory reset option for the Pi operating system. Now, operating systems on Raspberry Pis are a little bit different to uh, your desktop or your laptop. At least they are for me. I find myself quite frequently just putting a, a completely fresh version of uh, the Raspberry Pi operating system or any Linux operating system onto an SD card and using it on my Pi for the length of that project. Usually when it's time to start a new project, I'll just get a completely fresh uh, SD card. And there are very few SD cards that have an operating system on them for longer than, say, a couple of months. So as you can see, it's a simple terminal command to factory reset the Pi, which is something that we couldn't have done before, at least not easily. And there's a bunch of reasons why you might want to do this. Um, for me, in general, it's just because certainly when I was learning Linux, it was a lot easier just to start from scratch completely than to try and debug why something was going wrong when libraries wouldn't work happily with each other. Um, and I certainly found a lot of the times that if I went online and I searched for kind of how to fix a certain problem, invariably the second or third comment on any forum would be, have you tried it with a fresh operating system? This is a quick way to do that. 
Anyway, I'll leave a link to this video in the description along with the uh, GitHub page for the G Assist Pi, which is also worth a look. And uh, Sid's eClassroom is a fantastic channel in general. There's just a massive wealth of stuff you can do, a lot of which is uh, working with things like uh, Alexa and Google Home. Um, and I've learned a lot about um, different APIs and things from this channel. Uh, it's really, really well put together and one of those hidden gems of the internet. If you're not already subscribed to him, I'd suggest giving him a subscription. A few weeks ago on the show, I featured Mitchell Davis and his Arduino 2 STM32 series, which he has now renamed to Bare Metal MCU, which I think is actually a far better title. This is the culmination of that series, um, and rather than moving to STM32, um, this is how to do bare metal programming on an AT Tiny 85, which is a very, very small AT mega chip. Now this series is invaluable to anyone who's worked with Arduinos and the Arduino IDE and wondered what is going on behind the scenes. Um, as I've mentioned several times on this show, I'm fascinated with the idea of taking away the nice and easy tools and learning what happens behind the scenes. I don't need to do that, um, but it's something I am interested in. So this series has been absolutely like catnip to me. So this is video nine in the series and the last in the current series, although I very much doubt it will be the end of this series as a whole. This is just sort of the end of this one particular chapter of breaking down how Arduino works into its constituent parts. And if you are interested in going back and seeing the rest of them, the previous episodes are all on his YouTube channel, which of course I will link in the description to this video. But anyway, yes, the, um, the Atmel tiny chips are actually really good things to get to know because they give you all of the functionality of an Arduino essentially just with far less pins and they run with, a, I believe, a slightly slower clock rate. But don't quote me on that, I might be wrong. Um, and uh, if you've ever wondered um, how to get things working on bare metal or have just been absolutely lost uh, if you don't have a computer science background uh, it, when you try to read it up and find out how dry some of the material can be, um, Mitchell's videos are absolutely indispensable. Um, and if there is one set of tutorial videos I suggest you watch in any spare time that you have if you are interested in learning how to do any kind of bare metal programming, this is the clearest description of it I have ever seen. And yeah, it's a fantastic channel. And just before we close out the show today, I just wanted to mention that the latest version of Armbian has been released. This is 20.08 Capel, or Capel, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But if you aren't familiar with Armbian, it is a fantastic alternative to Raspbian for numerous reasons. But if I had to put it simply, I think Raspbian is put together specifically to use with the Raspberry Pi. And of course it will work on Raspberry Pi clones, but Armbian kind of comes from a slightly different approach in that they're trying to put together a fully fledged operating system that will work across an entire plethora of single board computers. And that really does open you out to the idea of being able to try different single board computers and have an operating system on there that you know how to use already instead of being stuck into maybe putting a version of Linux on it that you don't know or stuck with a version of Linux that is designed specifically by the makers of that board. Now that example might not have been explained perfectly well, but if you do want to see what I mean, um, there's a couple of articles on the Electromeca website that might interest you, uh, both by my colleague Mo Long. One on how to install Ambient on the Libra computer Renegade ROC RK3328CC, which is a name and also a powerful SBC. Um, but as well as that, oh, there's me again. That's very weird. Um, but as well as that, um, yeah, is how to get started with it on the Orange Pi as well. Um, and if you are interested in reading through the change notes, um, there'll be a link to the Ambien site in the description, uh, with of course, um, you know, all of the sources to get the latest build of Ambien to try out. And just before finishing the show today, just a quick reminder that um, if you have projects that you're working on that you want to share, the Electromaker site is a great place to do so. Um, but not just that, uh, these videos that I am putting out um, are not just supposed to be one direction. Uh, I am very happy to tell you the things that I find cool, but anything that you see during the week or anything that you are working on that you think might be interesting to the show, um, yeah, leave us a comment on the video, get in touch with us via social media. We're always looking for interesting things to talk about. Um, and people who watch this show especially, I imagine have very specific interests because we're talking about quite specific things uh, please do let us know what you're working on maybe we'll feature it on the show one week oh the sanity check what's this about a mask that randomly glows its eyes but no 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 there'll be a link in the description if you want to see that no that is it for the Electromaker show this week. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are enjoying the show, please do let us know by giving us a thumbs up or leaving us a comment on the video. But for now, I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay creative, stay healthy, and I'll see you then. <laughs>